Christianity has been conditioned to understand power. And, and what I'm trying to point out here is saying, well, what are you talking about meekness and power? Because in many ways, power, the, the opposite of power is not weakness, or I guess the opposite of power is weakness, but the way that we treat power, according to Jesus and the gospel, is with meekness. But, but this is very countercultural and counterintuitive for humans. We don't like to see power and treat it with meekness. We don't, if we have power, we want to enact that power. We don't want to be meek with that power. And we'll define meekness in a second. But first we have to define power. So what, how, how, before Jesus offers this command, how throughout human history has, have we dealt with power? And 2,000 years later, how do we still deal with power today? Well, basically what I would argue, and, and maybe this is not factual, you know, this is just kind of how I came to this through the process of writing this message and reading commentaries and, and studying the Greek and things like this. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, the way that it looks to me in human history that we have dealt with power is that those who have power enact that power and people love that. We as a society love to know who's in charge and we love for them to kind of be assertive with the power that they have. And I would argue that this is, I would argue in, in conjunction with evolutionary uh, sociologists and anthropologists, that the reason that this is, is because for over 90% of human existence, we were hunter-gatherers. We were not agricultural societies. I mean, in the grand scheme of human history, 99.9% .9 of human history, we didn't have cars, we didn't have mass communication. This is all very novel to us today, the way that we live today in relative security is very novel worldwide. For 90, over 90% 90 of human history, we were just hopping one place to the next. A sickness, death, almost immediately. You know, Dave Chappelle makes a joke, uh, the only 150 years ago, diarrhea is probably going to kill you, right? It's kind of crazy. But, but for 90% of human history, over 90% of human history, we are hunter-gatherers. And, and what's the most important thing about being a hunter-gatherer? Decisiveness in your leadership. Decisiveness in your leadership. Because if you are in a hunter-gatherer tribe, because humans have been social for our entire time. There was never a point where like there was a caveman alone in a cave somewhere with his cave lady and that was it. That's not how we have ever existed in human history. We have always existed in tribes and there have always been leaders in those tribes. And throughout, throughout human history, as we have deferred to our leaders, we wanted leaders who were going to be decisive because here's the thing. Being discerning, slow to make a decision, was not to our advantage. Moving on, you know, okay, we got to go left or we got to go right. We got to follow the buffalo to the right or to the left, whatever. Even if you make the wrong choice, it's better than standing still. Now we are, find ourselves in a, in, a, in a world where probably we should slow down and we should consider the things that we do. We should consider the impact. Everything goes so fast today. We should probably be a little bit slower and more discerning. And this is what Jesus is offering us as he is existing in this agricultural agrarian society. He's going, hey, maybe we don't need to act like hunter-gatherers. Maybe we don't need to be decisive and assertive and defensive. Because this is what people look for in their hunter-gatherer tribe leaders. They wanted a, uh, they wanted a, a leader, and, and in ancient societies that were constantly warring with one another, even post-agrarian society, what they wanted was they wanted a leader who if anybody stepped up on that leader, that leader would put him right back down. Because that's, it, 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 it provides clarity. Whenever we had to make a decision, attack the enemy or don't attack, move left to follow the buffalo or move right, the leader would just make the decision. No discussion. Assertiveness, domination, defensiveness. This is what we wanted out of our leaders because we were incredibly vulnerable and that made us feel secure. But Jesus offers us maybe this is not the way that we should look to power anymore. Jesus says, not that the meek have inherited the earth, but rather that in the kingdom of God, the way that the kingdom of God is set up, and by the way, the earth is included in the kingdom of God. There's not some you know, ethereal, disembodied heaven waiting for us. It's the renewal of the earth is what Jesus said. So if in the renewed kingdom of God, who is going to be in charge? The meek. Those who do not make assertive, rash, defensive decisions. That that is how we wield power correctly. 
So let's go to the next slide. This is, what, this is the Greek word for meek. It's a, a little bit easier. It's praise. Praise. Um, kind of like praise, but praise. And, and this, mean, this word does not mean one thing. This is why uh, in English, it doesn't mean one thing in English. If, if you go into English translations, you look at the KJV or the NRSV or the NIV or the American Standard Bible, you know, NIV, American Standard Bible, NRSV, those are all really good translations. They all translate this word differently. American Standard translates this, uh, I believe, gentle. The NRSV takes its cues from the King James, meek. And uh, the NIV translates it humble. But what's funny is all three of these are actually part of the same word in Greek. The word in Greek is, is an orientation not of lacking power, but of enacting your power in such a way as that you are gentle with it, that you are humble with it, and that you do not seek for more. This is that you're meek. This is how, and, and you know what's funny? When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, in the same way as he says, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are the mourners, we don't necessarily look at meekness as a derogatory term. In the ancient world, they did. In ancient Greco-Roman society, meekness was a vice, not a virtue. So a person who had power and chose to enact it gently, not decisively. A person who had power, but yet was humble with the wisdom that they possessed. A person who had power, but did not seek for more power, was considered a fool. They were not celebrated. They were a sucker. They were weak. They didn't have what it took to take control. You know where I hear that today? in all aspects of American politics and in all aspects of, of business. You know what we want out of our CEOs and our senators? Same thing. Assertiveness, decisiveness, and defensiveness. The other side attacks you, you go get them. The other side comes up with an idea, you make sure it doesn't work. Your company wants to do something, you know, give more power to, to, to more people on a board. No, you take control. You assert yourself. Buy more stock. Buy 51% of the company and take control. This is how we think of it. So it is in many ways a vice to us, but we don't think of it that way. So, so when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he says, no, no, actually, this is what it looks like to lead. This is what it looks like to lead. And it makes us incredibly uncomfortable. I remember a sermon by Francis Chan, who, who was a, a really influential in my early days of, of ministry. And he does this whole thing on Easter in like 2008 or 2009, where, where he like, he has all these people in his gigantic mega church, and he's like, he's like, you guys just think Jesus is meek and mild. He's not. He's powerful, and he's gonna, he could kill you in any second. And 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 I, I really liked the sermon at the at the time because I thought, oh yeah, you know, I don't want to think of Jesus as being weak. What I failed to realize was that Francis Chan was equating meekness and weakness because Francis Chan doesn't agree to Greek. He was looking at the English definitions of meek and weak, and he said, oh, these are the same thing. Therefore, Jesus must be weak if Jesus is meek. But Francis Chan doesn't read Greek, so he didn't know that the real word was praise, and that actually it's not about lacking in power. In fact, meekness assumes power. Meekness assumes that it's not weakness. Meekness cannot be weakness because if you don't have any power, you can't choose to not enact it. If you don't have any wisdom, you can't choose to be humble. You're just ignorant. If you don't have any power, you can't choose to be powerless for the sake of others. You can't go out and get more power if you have none to start with and you have nothing to barter with. Meekness is necessarily not weakness. In fact, when we say that Jesus is meek, we say that Jesus is powerful. And this is the point that I want to get to today. Meekness is not weakness. And this is the challenge for us today. In our society, in the way that we view power, in the message of Jesus, can we be different than the summation of almost all of human history where we think that having power and enacting that power is what's good in leadership? Can we be a church first? Well, I guess no. Can we be individuals first? And then families, and then a church who who looks at the power and privilege that we have by by being in the richest country in the history of the world and having money and having influence and and, and having, uh, 
you know, the way, you know, if we're parents, we have influence over our kids. If we're grandparents, we have influence over our kids and our grandkids. Can we look at that influence and go, this is a responsibility for me to act in such a way that does not seek for more, that does not grasp for more, that when I have the power to, to, to beat down somebody else, and that's how Francis starts his whole sermon. He says, how many of you could beat me up? Who cares if you can beat somebody up? The point is, will you? Who cares if you can sue somebody into oblivion because you have the right lawyer and they haven't, they're, they're bad and they don't know anything? It's not about what you have. It's about what you do with it. And this is what Jesus is trying to go at. He's saying meekness is not weakness. Weak, meekness is mercy. Meekness is not foolishness. Meekness is the humility to know that even if you're wise, even if you're the smartest person in the room, you still don't know everything, and so you should probably about it. Meekness is not foolishness, it's humility. Meekness is not passivity. Meekness is intentional non-defensiveness. Do you understand that it's much easier to just sound off every time somebody offends you? To just jump, well, I'm gonna go get them. You know what I do? I have to resist that urge because I grew up in this country and I grew up with these values, even though I grew up in the church. I still grew up with these values that, you know what, when somebody drags me on uh, Twitter, I don't know, I'm not on Twitter. When somebody drags me on Facebook or whatever, somebody says that I'm an idiot and this is, I just want to put them in a hole. Meekness is knowing that you could and choosing not to. It is far simpler, it requires far less emotional and mental maturity to not sound off when you're triggered. It is not <laughs> virtuous or impressive, in or according to Jesus, to love those who you love. It's virtuous and impressive to love your enemy. It shows me nothing that you get along with the people who you agree with. It shows me everything, how you treat the people who you don't. It's far less virtuous and impressive. In fact, it's not virtuous and impressive at all to wield the power you have for your own personal gain. You know who else does that? Animals, like baboons. Baboons can like, you know, they, they get mad and they have power. They're the biggest baboon. They just go beat up the next smallest baboon. Take it. You know, you have a mango. I want it and I'm going to get it. It's not impressive. That doesn't show me anything about your humanity. What's virtuous and impressive and worthy of dominion, worthy of leadership, the, the right to inherit the earth, according to Jesus, is to choose to, is to, when you have power, choose not to wield it for your own gain. And so as we come to a table today, which we do now, as we come to a communion table, I want you to reflect on the fact that the communion table represents a night in history where Jesus, not because he was weak, but because he was powerful, not because he had to go to the cross, but because he chose to, that Jesus takes and breaks bread with his enemy, Judas. He offers him the cup and the bread, knowing that Judas is going to sell him out that very night. And then even when he is sold out, when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter draws his sword to try and defend Jesus, Jesus says, again, no, I could win this battle. I could beat these guys down. I could have angels and dominion. I don't want that. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is choosing not to wield your power. And so when you take this bread and you take this cup, remember that it is from a meek Savior who offers to each and every one of us the opportunity to eat and drink and let those, those flavors marinate in our hearts and remind us that the way to victory is always through meekness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do not presume to come to your table out of our own abilities, out of our own righteousness, Instead, we trust in your manifold and great mercies. Lord, we appreciate that the way that we have lived together, not only today but throughout human history, does not render us worthy to gather up the crumbs from under this table. But you're the same Lord whose nature is always to choose and have mercy 
because of your meekness. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so that we might eat and this bread and drink this cup and that we may evermore dwell in you. Amen. Friends, we now have the opportunity to uh, come to this table. This is not our table where you have to agree with everything that I say in order to have access to the elements. You don't even have to agree with any covenant theology. You don't have to agree with any orthodox theology as far as I'm concerned. As long as you believe that Jesus is calling you to take and drink, you're welcome. So we don't hold this table over anyone. We offer it freely to all, knowing that it is not ours to offer, but rather that we are conduits for the manifold and great mercies of Christ who took bread and gave it. Let our eyes be open to who Jesus is. We now take this opportunity to confess our sins. I'll leave some space for you to remember that sin is both the ways in which you've done and broken the simple, silly rules, but also that sin is the ways in which, in a much larger way, you've put yourself in front of your neighbor by both things that you've done and things that you've un- not done, by ways that you have chosen not to wield your power for the good of those who have less, and for the ways that you have chosen to wield your power for personal gain. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We're truly sorry. We humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your will, walk in your way to the glory of your name forever. Amen. The good news of the Old Testament is that if we are faithful to confess our sins, God will be faithful and just to forgive us those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May now the Almighty God have mercy on us and forgive us our sins through the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen us in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit and keep us from now into eternal life. We now have an opportunity for us to affirm our faith together. Remember that affirmations are just those. They're your way of saying, I'm part of this group. I'm on the inside. It's not a way of saying, I agree with everything that everyone has ever said that's part of this group, but rather to say, I own these people and they own me. Let's say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I now hand down to you, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, who has been with us this whole time and now offers us a chance to be with you in response to your call to be blessed through our actions. We thank you for these elements, for food for the journey, and for the call that you have placed on our lives. 
pray all these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to play our last song. I invite you to sing as you will. Um, And as you take the elements, take them as they come to you. You need not wait, for we have all partaken in them together through the blessing of Christ. Amen. myself away I give myself away for you to use me I give myself away I give myself away so you
cafe. Please join us for cafe and hear this charge and benediction for you today. Friends, it is not that we have power. It is not that we have influence. It is not that we have privilege. These things in and of themselves are not bad. It is how we use these things. Do we use them as the world uses them? Do we use them as countless politicians have sold us, countless CEOs and dictators and world leaders have tried to convince us for the last 10,000 years? Or do we choose a new way? The way of a meek and humble carpenter who said, you do not take my life, but I give it. Who said, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. Who said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.